and obviously there's so many implications, you could go a lot of directions, but let's look quickly at chapter 5 because he gets into the same thing. Paul just cannot get away from this, the reality of this, the, the revelation of it. Now this is the, uh, the passage wives love so much. Beginning in verse 22, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now, I'll just pause because this is not the subject here, but I will pause and say this, the picture drawn in this passage is not of a selfish husband abusing a poor subservient wife. That's not the picture here. This is a love relationship in which they are one. And there are differing roles, but it's certainly not anything about what people would tend to think. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also their wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. This is the key here. This is where it all is supposed to come from. Love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. So the process, Paul has already talked about the goal. The process involves the head reaching out to the body, ministering the grace, ministering the wherewithal so that it is cleansed, so that it is made ready for all that God has intended. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself. Now you have a different metaphor, if you will. Now you have a husband and a wife. But he's getting us ready. In this metaphor, we are the, we're the wife. And he is, his, his heart is so focused upon us that he is doing everything that's necessary to make us ready to present. I'll tell you, we have no clue what it's going to be like when the bride of Christ is completely ready to be presented to him. It will just, I mean, it would blow our minds if we even had a half a clue what God has in mind. Now he comes down to the, to the human relationship it says, in this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Now, that's interesting. He who loves his wife loves who? Himself. Now, that sounds like a relationship in which you don't really have two quite, quite two individuals anymore. You have such a union that the husband regards his wife as, that's part of me. That's part of me. Just let that sink in. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body. I guess there could be some people who are so mixed up they, they do in a sense. But no one hates his own body. If it, he feeds it. He cares for it. Just as Christ does the church. He keeps going back to Christ in the church, doesn't he? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Now this is the thing. This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. When Christ looks at you, what does he see? I mean, how do you see yourself when you think about him? You think about him so glorious up there and you down here, such a sorry rascal. How could he love me? How could he do anything? What hope do I have? Did devil ever tell anybody that? But how does Christ look upon you and me? He says, that's part of me. The weakest, the lowest, if you want to use those types of expressions as we think of things, he looks down and says, that's me. Saul, why are you persecuting me? You are part of him. He is so married to you, so committed to you that he is going to do whatever it takes. We need, folks, we need, to, we need to wake up and have a confidence in the love of God and the purpose of God. This is words, these are words we need to believe. We need to get our, wrap our minds around the reality that we are so one with him. He looks upon us as a part of himself. He cherishes us as if we were him, his own body. Because we are. And what does I say? As if. Because we are. That's a mystery, isn't it? That's why Paul expressed it the way. He said, this is a profound mystery. He, you could sense his struggle to even communicate it. But the moment I believe that God, that Jesus, rather, spoke to him. 
and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? There was birthed in him a seed of truth that you see flowing through all of his writings. We are so one with him. We are his body in the earth. We are meant to, to be a, a receptacle, not just individually, but together, collectively, each with our own abilities, serving one another in love, believing in him, drawing our life from him, growing up into him and everything that he has purposed. Praise God. I don't know what else to say. Like I say, there's so many. But just, just let, this, let this view, because this is the truth. However you've been looking at your life, however you've been looking at church, however you've been looking at him, this is the reality that God, is, God established in the beginning. He established a people in whom he lived, through whom he walked. You know, we say so glibly, we're his hands, we're his, you yeah. know. That's true. But we need to understand it's really true. When you get mad at somebody, who are you getting mad at? Well, you're getting mad at him. You're getting mad at yourself. Think about that. How you think about your brother, how you treat them. That's how you're treating him. But it's how you're treating yourself. You're, you're married to them. I mean, it's like I've used the illustration. How stupid would it be for my, my hands to go have a fight? They belong to the same body. But we're just as stupid. We let all kinds of human corrupt considerations enter in. When God has called us to live together, to walk together. Even as Christ came not to do his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him. So he has called us to walk together. To look to him as head. And to do his will. And to lay down our lives. Is his call, is his purpose not worth everything? If you've ever caught the smearest glimpse of what God has laid before us, it's worth everything. How many of our fellow, fellow believers, even today, I was going to say over the centuries, have laid down their lives because they believed the revelation that God of what God has done? It was worth giving up their lives to possess that. But it, isn't just, it wasn't just then, it's now. I get reports all the time of... Christians in incredibly difficult places. They're our brothers and sisters. They're connected to us. May God just give us a fresh vision. May it change the way we see him. May it change the way we understand he sees us. May it give us faith because we stand not upon our own abilities but upon his, his work at the cross. And may it affect how we relate one to another. It makes perfect sense of his command that we love one another. You're loving yourself, and you do, by every measure. I believe God has called this church to something amazing. We're nothing. But may God bring this reality, or bring this to a reality in our midst in a greater way. That's the only way he's going to get the glory. We can have all the doctrines, all the activities we want. If we don't have the reality of him living in us and expressing his life, we have nothing. But, if he, but as poor as we are, as sorry as we are, if we have him and he is allowed to function as the head and we are his body in reality, then we're on shouting ground, folks. What we do will matter, will, will last for eternity because it's not us doing it, it's him and it's for his glory. That's why Paul said, unto him be glory in the church throughout all the ceaseless ages of eternity. Praise God.